Thanks for joining us today. My name is Katie Kuzma. I'm a licensed psych professional with VHB. VHB has been engaged by Algonquin to advance the implementation of a real solution for the Kings Cove Conservation Restriction Area. Joining me today are other members of the VHB team. We have Mark Costa, Senior Water Resources Engineer, Seth Latrell, Massachusetts Energy Market Lead, and Laura Leach, Senior Environmental we are here to provide you with a summary of the draft phase four remedy implementation plan prepared for the King's Cove Conservation Restriction Area portion of the disposal site, located at 82 to 90 Bridge Street in Weymouth, Massachusetts. A copy of the draft phase four RIP was made available online on April 26 via MassDEP searchable database under release tracking number 4-002. A link to this database was emailed to the PIP email list on April 26th. However, if you prefer to view the document in person, there is a copy of the draft phase four report at both the Weymouth Board of Health and Tufts Library in Weymouth. The public comment period on the draft phase four report is currently open and runs until May 28th, 2024. Our agenda for this evening is as follows. We will be providing an overview of the findings of the Phase 3 Remedial Action Plan and then diving into the details of the draft Phase 4, including a discussion of the design and permits required to advance the remedial solution. Our presentation will take about 20 minutes, so there will be ample time for questions and answers following the presentation. This meeting will run until 9 p.m. Next we have design related terminology. These definitions are also provided on the handout. For context, I'd like to point out a couple of key features in the figure on the right of the slide here. The yellow area here is the upland portion. This is the area above mean high water line. The blue area is the shore portion and is the area below mean high water. Revetment, this is a structure constructed along the shoreline to reduce erosion and dissipate wave energy. You can see the existing revetment here in this gray patterned area. Hmm. As many of you know, the site is a state listed disposal site, and the assessment and cleanup of disposal sites is regulated under the Massachusetts Contingency Plan, or MCP. The MCP process is based on a phase approach. A final phase three remedial action plan was submitted to MassDEP in August 2023. Phase three is an evaluation that results in the selection of a remedial solution that is 
likely to achieve a permanent solution which is contingent upon achieving a condition of no significant risk. The phase three submitted in August 2023 resulted in the selection of a remedial solution which was based on a review of several criteria including effectiveness, reliability, risks, benefits, and taxes. The solution detailed in the phase three is to extend the existing stone revetment and record an AUL for the upland portion. An AUL is a written notice filed at the Registry of Deeds noting activities and uses which are required or restricted in order to maintain a condition of no significant risk. The solution for the upland portion utilizes a well-established method of preventing erosion, which is a coastal revetment. It has the shortest estimated timeline to implement based on the alternatives analyzed. Furthermore, the AUL will result in achieving a condition of no significant risk to human health by restricting future exposures to the fill. The solution for the shore portion is to excavate an area of fill below mean high water that contains concentrations of nickel and vanadium above the apparent effects thresholds. Then, to reuse a portion of this fill behind the new revetment and dispose of the remaining excess fill if necessary. This solution does not impact the revetment design. It satisfies the preference for removal indicated by MassDP following the results of the Stage 2 ecological risk characterization and also results in clean fill replacement in this area. These solutions address the potential future risk to visitors and residents who might be exposed to fill at certain depths in the upland portion and results in the prevention of further erosion that could expose fill containing higher concentrations of arsenic. Lastly, the shore solution also satisfies MassDEP's preference to remove an area of fill below mean high water containing nickel and vanadium exceeding the apparent effects threshold. As stated here, the phase four presents the design and steps for implementation of the remedial solution. The draft phase four submitted to MassDEP on April 26 presents the following information. Design objectives, as discussed earlier, the overall objective of the design is to implement the remedial solution and achieve a condition of no significant risk, which would allow for the filing of a permanent solution statement with an activity and use limitation. In terms of timeline, this work could begin in fall 2025 and be completed by early 2026, depending on the timing of approvals for several required permits, which staff will discuss later. This implementation schedule will require a request to MassDP to extend the permanent solution deadline from April 2025 until after the remedial solution implementation is complete and the AUL has been filed. Conceptual and permitting plans, we will discuss these in the next few slides. And lastly, the phase four contains uh, information regarding controls, monitoring, and management. These include steps such as establishing sedimentation and erosion controls prior to implementation, conducting fence line air and dust monitoring during implementation, and documenting if the work conducted meets the requirements of the phase four plan. Next, Mark Costa will describe the remedial solution design and steps for implementation. Right hand 
right-hand side will be this southern area. So again, just to orient ourselves, this is the northern area I was just showing you. Again, Kings Cove Park is to the west, and Deray Pump Station is off the page to the north. Kings Cove is to the east. Uh, same thing on the right-hand side. Kings Cove is to the east. Bridge Street is right here. So this is the southern portion of the project on the right-hand side. Uh, so this plan highlights different regulatory areas associated with the Wetlands Protection Act, including land subject to coastal storm flowage, mean high water, and coastal bank. It also shows our proposed materials, so the cobbles and the riprap that Katie had mentioned. Uh, it's also showing our proposed workspace for the contractor, as well as our proposed grading for the project. So what we're seeing is really a refinement of that phase three plan that was proposed. So the first area is that shoreline solution in this gray area. And so that gray area is shown as the area to be to have one foot of that existing film material to be removed and replaced with one foot of cobble material. So this would be simply replacing the existing material up there with that new cobble material. Uh, and there'll be no change in elevation at that location. Next is that solution for the erosion that's occurring in the southern limits, so that's down from here. This will be simply extending that existing riprap, so the existing riprap ends right about here, that, are, that is along the cove, and extending that 200 feet southerly, where the laser point area is right here. In addition to the riprap revetment, we'll also be proposing cobbles in front of that for wave opinion. And that will go down to mean high water. And then finally, we're simply connecting those two areas, the northern and the southern area, with cobbles through this area right here. So some of our major goals with this design is to reduce the impacts to Kings Cove Park right here. And the way we're doing that is proposing access off of Bridge Street for the contractor, right through here. Uh, this does make the access a little bit tougher. Uh, it does require a mass DOT access permit, but it reduces impacts to the vegetation and the park in this location. Uh, we also have located the riprap outside of the existing locations of the trees along the coastal bank. Uh, and we do call for the contractor to maintain all existing vegetation. Um, and if anything is disturbed, it shall be replaced in kind. And then finally, we're also uh, implementing several measures to reduce erosion and provide erosion control. So we're proposing a turbidity permit along the exterior seaward side of the project. We're also proposing a Sandbank Copper Dam in this location, right through here. Uh, the Sandbank Copper Dam will allow the contractor to work in the dry to install that revetment. And it also provides erosion control. And then we're also installing a construction riprap entrance next to Bridge Street. So we've also prepared a rendering of the project. So this is a three-dimensional model to create our best effort simulation for this final condition. <clears throat> so this is standing right next to, right on that abutting property facing the area of erosion um, in this project area we're talking about. So on the left-hand side, this is just a photo of the existing conditions facing the project site. You can see the existing riprap ends right around there. Um, and on the right-hand side of the screen is our proposed project. And those um, different elements we just mentioned, so we extending that riprap, that 200 feet approximately. We're proposing that cobble right through here. And then all the way to the north is that shoreline solution and that proposed cobble right up through here. So this is 
the same figure. Uh, now we've added uh, the approximate location of a few key elevations to provide some context. Um, so this bottom line right through here is the location of mean high water. Uh, we've also added in the next line here is the highest astronomical tide. And then finally, this last line all the way up is the levels reached during winter storm bracing. So what we're looking at here is a few typical design cross-sections of the proposed riprap. On the left-hand side, right through here, is where we have the uh, maximum vertical change between the shoreline and the Kingscope Park. So we have Kingscope Park on the, to the left of the cross-section right here, and we have Kings Cove itself on the right-hand side. And so at its maximum point, we're expecting that river abrevetment to be approximately seven feet high. As we move closer to Bridge Street, that river significantly reduces, the park elevation reduces as you get closer to Bridge Street, and in this section, you'd actually only see two feet of river rap. We're also proposing a geotextile fabric for separation and a tow for stability. On the bottom is the cross section of that shoreline solution. So as I mentioned, that's simply removing one foot or 12 inches of that existing fill material and replacing it with the cobble material. This is our construction phasing. So again, we had several goals of reducing disturbance to the existing park, reducing the potential for erosion, and then finally implementing the solution. So here's our phasing. First is to collect soil and sediment samples to, to determine disposition. Next we'll install those site controls, and I had mentioned that earlier with the turbidity curve in, with the temporary sandbank copper dam, uh, as well as that construction and access near Bridge Street. We'll be calling in our plans for the contractor to dredge, and so that's work, and that Moving that existing material below mean high water is what dredge is during low tides only. They'll be placing that dredge material in the staging area and waiting for reuse or disposal. Next, we will place that clean cobble cover I had mentioned. And then we will construct the rip wrap or abetment, including reusing a subset of the dredge material. Next, we'll dispose of the material, the dredge material, off-site, that remaining material. And then we'll restore the construction access areas and staging areas and remove those site controls. And with that, I'm going to pass it to Seth to discuss permitting. Conservation Commission. The project will advance to state review 
under the Massachusetts Environmental Policy Act, or MEPA, with the filing of an expanded notification, uh, environmental notification form, as well as an environmental impact report. <laughs> Both of those filings are anticipated to have at least a 30-day written public comment period. And prior to each of those filings, the team will provide advanced notification to the community with targeted outreach to environmental justice communities to encourage meaningful engagement throughout the MEPA review process. Concurrent with this review, the team will submit applications to DEP for both the water quality certificate as well as a Chapter 91 license, which will include a 30-day public comment period. The work will then advance the review with the Army Corps of Engineers for the work below the high tide line and with Mass DOT for construction access to Bridge Street. Based on this current schedule, construction will begin no sooner than fall of 2025 and last approximately <coughs> five months. So that concludes the formal presentation today. So before we transition over to Q&A, a reminder uh, that written comments uh, are, uh, the written comment period on phase four is currently open and written comments are due on May 28th. To provide comment, you can send an email to uh, the email address on the screen here, which is just Wayman Compressor Station at BUTP.com, and written responses will be provided as part of the final phase four. So now we would like to open the floor to offer an opportunity for folks in attendance to ask questions or offer comments on the remedial solution. I will be facilitating today's Q&A and would like to suggest a few guidelines to ensure constructive and inclusive dialogue. First, if you would like to offer comment, please step up to the microphone here and state your name and if you're comfortable your address for the record prior to offering comment. To keep things efficient and orderly, we recommend lining up three to four people at a time. Second, to ensure that all attendees have an opportunity to make a comment, uh, we would ask that folks keep their comments to three to four minutes. Uh, if you do have additional comments that you would like to provide beyond that three to four minute window, you're welcome to come back up to the microphone after others have had a chance to speak. Lastly, a reminder, this is an ongoing process, and while we'll take all comments into consideration and respond to questions on the remedial solution where we are able, if we are unable to respond to your questions at this point, responses will be provided in writing as part of the phase four. So with that, we will begin the Q&A period. Um, and reviewed by Mass CP. 
Um, and it was determined that Massey preferred to actually remove that area below mean high water. Um, and it's delineated with sampling locations, um, and we will be removing those areas that exceed the apparent effects thresholds for nickel and vanadium. And so that's how that area was determined. The depth is 12 inches. So it's really just to uh, replace the existing unnatural fill material with a more natural substrate for benthic organisms. And the second part was uh, how do you decide what's going to be reused? Yes, so second question was how to decide what would be reused. Um, so essentially, we're not going to be expecting a lot of material that would be reusable. Um, just based on we don't have a lot of area for fill behind the revetment. So whatever little material can be reused will be reused. And the material that cannot be reused will be um, tested, it will be first stockpiled, um, tested to meet facility requirements for testing so that we can find a licensed permitted facility to accept that material that cannot be reused. I'll just add that we want that material to be inorganic, so free draining, and we're really expecting all that you've been out there. You know, it's it is free draining material. There's no organic slow or anything like that. So uh, as long as it's free draining, we can reuse it um, on a structural level behind uh, the riprap. Hi, Mike, Mike Lang, uh, 74 Cotton Apple Brain Tree. Um, I'll, I'll go on uh, Margaret's question there as far as the material goes. You have a storage area there where I assume that's the contaminated material that you're talking about being moved out of there, cut out. Is that correct? You have this storage area. That, yeah, you have, you have this spot where you have material that, that you said would be potentially shipped out, trucked out of that area. That's right, right there. Yeah, so just a quick you mind if I jump in? Sure. So there's there's really two storage areas. Um, one is an area for the contract contractor to lay down their equipment as well as new material coming into the site like the rip wraps and the cobbles to store it. So that's going to be right through here. So west of the compressor station, east of the metering station, that gravel area right there. So that's where that material will be stored. The material that's coming off the beach is going to be stored closer to Bridge Street, right through here. So that's where the dredge material will be stored until it goes off site. All right, well, well, I'll just go on to what I was gonna ask anyway. I had assumed that that was a contaminated material and that's at a, a retention pond over there, which means you probably need a water discharge permit to store that crap at that area. Uh, the other thing is, one of the things, I, I gotta be honest with you, I didn't read your 853 pages. Um, to me, I, I enjoy reading this stuff normally, but uh, from my 50 years doing this, this is like, where's Waldo? I'm trying to find something that's truthful in there. And there's nothing truthful in your documentation. And I assume that you've worked out with this. This is the uh, final phase three medial action plan uh, by TRC. And on at 8.0 limitations, they state the findings and conclusions must be considered not as scientific uncertainties, but rather as professional opinions. Is that your position? And it goes on to say, it says, TRC did not attempt to independently verify the accuracy or completeness of all the information reviewed or received during the course of this evaluation. So am I assuming that you actually just went by the material that you have there as studies and things that TRC did? Yes, Mr. Lang, I think I can address that. Um, so I don't have that document in front of me right now, um, but the solution that we are here to propose today is based on an extensive amount of investigatory work uh, and review by the Department of Environmental Protection. But uh, I did read some of the material and it said that you used the existing studies and things like that. The existing studies were all done by TRC, or if not TRC, one of their subsidiaries of, um, of Enbridge or one of those people. 
So I'm assuming that that's what you went by. And if you go by that, if you go by this limitation, by the way, every other public documentation doesn't call it limitations, they call it disclaimers. You might want to write that down, disclaimers, because what it says in the PIC is that the scientific data you got hasn't been verified, hasn't even been studied, hasn't been looked at. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, I just want to find out if the VHB position is the same position as the TRC. Cyrus Long, was that a question there, or did you restate what the question was? Yeah, sure, let's go with it. Uh, is your position the same, that you didn't verify any of this information, you just went by the studies? So I, I think that I answered that previously. That no, you didn't. It's like... All right. Um, anyway, um, no, I, I have a, what I'd like to do, I have also have um, a document here that I had submitted to, um, what's this, Phase three Remedial Action Plan, the King Scope Conservation. Anyway, when we received the uh, comments back from TRC, they didn't answer any questions. What they do is they tend to mush them all together and dilute them with other non-answers, you know? And what I want to do is, and I'm assuming that this material is public record. Is that right? That's correct, yes. Okay. I have these documents I'd like to include in the, the, your, your documentation as part of the record. So there's three documents here. One of them, oh, you love this one. This is a picture of, I love this. They actually put their name on these bricks. And this is the one where they say there's no asbestos anywhere. And they actually put their names on it. And if you do some research, they'll tell you how much asbestos is in each of these bricks, up to 80% anywhere. So I'd like these to be submitted as part of the record. So during construction, there's going to be vanadium dust. And uh, phase four describes that they'll be monitoring. And I want to know whether that monitoring will be made available to the public in real time. Like, mm -hmm. will there be a posting of how much dust every day? Uh, it's stuff that we should know. Uh, and then there's another uh, air monitoring process too. It's the particulate matter 10, PM10. Will that be made available to the public in real time? Not at the end of the report, but every day they do the testing. Will there be a place that we can, as citizens, find out how much vanadium dust and how much PM10? So what I am hearing from you is you have mitigation process. Mm -hmm. 
but I want to know the numbers. I want to know what's going on mm -hmm. there. Is there a way that we can know that, oh, that Thursday it went above the uh, accepted level? So right now the plan would be just to put that into the final phase for <laughs> uh, completion report, but we can certainly take your comment under consideration. It's Michael Lang again. I, I'm an old guy. I, I forget a lot. Anyway, one of the questions I forgot to see, but the part I did read in your documentation was that these fixes aren't permanent. Now, that's kind of a big uh, answer. When you say they're not permanent, exactly how long do you anticipate these things actually doing what they're supposed to be doing? You know, protecting the water and the walkway and all. How long will they last? So what we do as engineers is uh, we design for a certain return period. So here we're designing for a 100-year event, which has a 1% annual chance of occurring. On top of that, we've also evaluated and are designing for increased sea levels, so up to 4.2 feet of sea level rise. And so what we do is we do wave modeling to understand the potential forces that a potential wave and storm event could hit and impact the revetment. Um, and we, we make sure that that riprap is sized to withstand those forces. So we are designing for a 1% event with sea level rise. But the, I'm sure these people would rather you say how many months, how many years, whatever like that. Uh, the 1% the, the storm or whatever may occur in this week. You know, would that mean that it's no longer gonna be there? If it were there right now, it would be washed away completely? I mean, you, you've got documentation, you've got experience, so you know how long this material lasts. Um, could we get some estimate of how long we can anticipate that actually staying there? So I, I'm not the engineer, but I, having worked with engineers my whole career, I can tell you that you know, the, the materials are used your stone. So if we're not talking about you know, timber, steel, something that has a, a very specific uh, design life. Um, but as engineers, they have to they have to sort of set parameters around what they're designing for. Uh, because they design around that one percent annual chance storm, doesn't mean that if that storm happened tomorrow, that that structure would disappear. Uh, what they're doing is sort of trying to, to uh, develop metrics to size around how this solution can be in place long term. Uh, but it is you know, we have to acknowledge it is a coastal environment. Uh, coastal environments are dynamic; they change. Uh, and so, from the engineering perspective, uh, they, our team has done their best to ensure that. Uh, this will provide a long-term solution for this, this area. I also work with engineers, and I know that they're not always right. As a matter of fact, I end up cleaning up this stuff. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name's Robert Kern, Squincy resident. Um, one comment in process I'd like to say on this side is I know the meeting space in the past has been in North Lane better there. I don't know if there was a scheduling problem there. Other process, and I, I did put this in writing to the applicant and you all, but um, the DEP website, I, I've been able to figure it out, but I think for the you know general citizens, it's not the most user-friendly website. Uh, no offense to DEP people, I know they're in the room, <laughs> but um, it'd be, I think it'd be nice if the applicant would post the materials, PDFs, the slideshows before the meeting on the PIP website, and you know, as a courtesy to the residents, you know, so they can look at it before. Um, so that's just one comment, just on process. Um, and um, but that being said, I just want to say I, I, I think the proposed alternative to to present to extend the revetment in a way to prevent uh, you know, future erosion is, is a good uh, thing. You know, protecting the contaminants behind the bank. So I think it, it's a good thing, and I think removing the vanadium nickel from the beach is a good thing. Um, and the geotech side material, I know there were some concerns in the previous, you know, engagements about that, but I think it has been used, so I just want to know on the record, I think that's a, an okay thing, in my personal opinion. Um, and I think that it, it, with respect to the cobbles, I think that it's a good addition. Um, to the beach, and I think that you know, we, you know, 
myself and others have put in comments in the past and I'm grateful that those uh, that was somewhat incorporated into the plan, uh, which is great in my opinion. Um, uh, the, uh, some of the concerns or just comments are uh, with respect to the berm or the, the cobbles added to the beach. Um, I, I would like the, you all to look at potentially adding more cobbles um, to towards where the access road is as a um, buffer for the edge effect from the revetment. Part of the reason I think there is erosion coming from that coastal bank with the clinkers behind it is because the revetment ends. And there's an edge effect, more erosion bouncing, waves bouncing off of that, um, you know, uh, revetment causing the coastal bank to erode. I have a concern that the erosion is going to be pushed towards, I think it's 91 Bridge Street where the mm -hmm. access road is. So adding additional cobbles to that area could potentially be a solution to help uh, mitigate that concern. Um, additionally, um, in permitting, because I, at least this is what I've read with respect to the cobbled stuff, in the permitting, they've, yeah, other places that have done it have, have had uh, initiative to say, in the permitting, you allow additional cobbles to be put in, in the case that we may need to add some more. So I just want to say that, look into that with permitting, and then with respect to the um, type of cobbles, I listened to a webinar about this. They said that sourcing the stone, you want to make sure you're sourcing it early. I think I put that in a written comment too, but um, the quarries, they, 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 they filter it out you know, when they're doing their you know, quarrying, digging. <laughs> um, so sourcing that early would be good. And in in what I've read is that the more natural cobbles that are not hanging are better uh, for that. And then um, the other comment, just a quick comment, and I think it's, in kind, but with, re with replacing shrubbery, just generally speaking, recommend planting native plants if possible. Um, you know, not planting invasive species plants. Um, I'll definitely put this in right too. And then the last thing, uh, not really MCP related, but I'm gonna, we don't necessarily have forms with uh, the applicant in Enbridge, so just want to put it on the record. Uh, and it'll be easier. We have a concern, by me personally and others, for public access on the opposite side of the park. I have some renderings I created here of that um, along sort of near with the area of the proposed contractor area on the West Park, West Waterfront easement. This was sort of a promise with the uh, Calpine Power Plant. You know, it's not in this specific meeting, but there's not many forums about this, so I'm just gonna plug. <laughs> we would love to have more access around the whole uh, peninsula, whether it be some boardwalk, just a trail, I have pictures that I created here personally. Um, so just want to plug that as an opportunity. So I have pictures here if you want to see. Is the board, proposed boardwalk potentially around the edge? And then um, the other thing that you know, people have been asking for, I know the, 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 uh, the people have been asking for for a while is more access on that side of the road, uh, outside of the Possible with a, you know, nothing crazy, some more trees, some, you know, a walkway, benches, picnic tables, similar to what we have in the park, but just more on the other side um, to sort of create a whole holistic um, experience for people walking around, not having to go back from the point there. And this is something that the public has been talking about for years and sort of delayed with the bridge construction and with the compressive construction, but I think it would be a, a great amenity for more uh, public access to this area that's more formalized. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for those comments. We'll, uh, we'll certainly take them into consideration. Oh, sorry. I don't know if this is my show. <laughs> <laughs> All right. About these seven approvals, I know you went through them, and you went through them pretty fast for me. Uh, and you had a timeline, you know, like there, there it is. And so the first hmm. approval is, looks like it's going to be the Weyman Conservation Commission. So of course that would be a public meeting. I mean, all the, you know, there would be an agenda, people would be notified, and then it's open to the public, it has to be. But I'm not 
sure about the rest of the other six. Um, when will we know? Will there be public information? How, what's the criteria for all these approvals? What are they looking for? What are they looking at? Um, it's just not clear. And uh, how, do, how do we find out? Is that going to be, are you going to have more than that slide in the, you know, what? I need more information. Yes, and, and happy to provide that. And I can uh, ask my colleague Laura to, to step in if I miss anything. Um, but you know, just sort of maybe walking through the list uh, with the Local Conservation Commission. Um, so that's enforcement of the Wetlands Protection Act. And so that's really an environmental focus, uh, ensuring that we have appropriate mitigation in place to minimize impacts to uh, our coastal resources within that area. So there is, as you noted, there will be a formal public hearing uh, through that process. Um, and then we step into the MEPA process. So MEPA is not a state permit. Um, it's a, a precursor to your permitting. So it's an environmental review process. Um, it does have a site visit component. Um, so not a, not a formal public hearing, but uh, an opportunity for uh, the community to ask questions. Um, that MEPA process also has an environmental justice engagement component. Uh, so prior to that ENF filing, 45 days at a minimum before that ENF filing, and ENF being the uh, environmental notification form, uh, we will be uh, sending out notifications, working with the MEPA office to establish an appropriate protocol for that engagement. Uh, it often includes newspaper notices, things of that nature, to ensure that there's awareness of the MEPA process. Uh, it's also uh, posted on the state's environmental monitor, uh, which I assume several of you are familiar with from the past. Um, so that will include uh, the deadlines for public comment uh, and access to uh, any filings. And the site visit is public? The site visit is public, you yes. It, that. And that will also be noticed on the, uh, in the environmental monitor. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's two. And so then that's followed with the environmental impact report. Uh, similar process. Uh, there's not a site visit associated with the environmental impact report, but it is noticed in the environmental monitor. Um, and MEPA is really a holistic state review of all of the, uh, the impact and actions at the state level. Um, so we will be providing a comprehensive assessment of project impacts as part of that filing. Um, following that, we have the water quality certificate. So that is uh, really a technical review on what material is being excavated, where it's going. Uh, that is all supported by the Department of Environment protection. Uh, there is not a public hearing associated with that process. Um, and then we have our Chapter 91 license with the Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, that does have a public comment period. Uh, there is an opportunity that DEP may have a uh, site um, or a public meeting associated with that filing, but it's not required. Um, and then the, the final three permits, the, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, um, which again is, is sort of a technical review of what material you're excavating below the high tide line, how are you mitigating fisheries impacts, and where is that material going. Uh, that does not have a formal public uh, comment period or public hearing. Uh, the Massachusetts Department of Transportation Public Access, uh, or Transportation Access Permit, uh, that's really a construction related permit, so it's access to Bridge Street. Uh, so that also would not have a, a formal public Pascal Berga, I'm with District 1 Town Council of Wayman, and my district is all of the ocean and waterways and, and from uh, Quincy to Geneva. Um, <clears throat> I'm not an environmental expert, nor did I read, and I did not read 840 uh, something pages. Um, some of it was just too co complicated to understand. Um, I just kind of have a question What is the life expectancy of this project, and how long do you expect the remediation to last? Sure. So um, I know Mark, Mark addressed that uh, briefly. Obviously, when talking about what they're designed for, uh, noting that the, the materials that they're using are, are really long-term. Uh, you know, they're using stone, uh, uh, there is geotextile fabric, but that's really the whole material basis as uh, the, the revetment that's established uh, and, and cobbles. But what they're designing for is a 1% uh, annual chance flood, so that's a 1 in 100 year um, storm event, rather, uh, as well as potential sea, sea level rise. A really long time really isn't an answer. Um, you know, 50 years, 100 years. And the my, my comment to come up here to say was, I'm sort of sick of hearing about the one, one, one 100 year storm. Um, by the year 2100, they're expecting a one in 100 year storm. 
every one to two years. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, as we get closer to that, we're going to be seeing more and more storms. And we experience that in North Weymouth. Boston has one of the highest sea temperature level rises in the world, I think second to Antarctica. So I'm really concerned about sea level rise. So I, I'm, I'm really not happy to hear the one in 100 year storm. I mean, we see um, excessive flooding and such. So that was just a comment. Um, if you can answer what a really long time means, I would be happy to hear that. So, Mark, I'm going to take more like out of time. I, we are accounting for sea level rise in this design as well. Uh, but I would acknowledge that you know, we do have to balance the accessibility and the functionality of the park along with this design. Uh, so to, to build to what a projected 2100 uh, storm event would be with sea level rise, you'd essentially be blocking that park from access to the waterfront. Uh, so what we did was we tried to uh, look at those projections uh, designed for what we think is, is a uh, realistic long-term solution, uh, but also ensure that we're maintaining the accessibility and functionality of the park. So I, I, I hear your comment. Um, you know, I think it would be, ideally we would be able to say, okay, this is, this material can last, its design life is 50 years, um, but in, a, in an environment like this, that's, that's not realistic. Thank you. Sorry, I just had a follow-up question. Um, on, with respect to the cobbles um, to the east, I guess, of the, the end of the revetment, is that something you all would take into consideration before the filing and that sort of thing? We will certainly look into that prior to filing. Okay. Because, you know, I'm going to put people who bring it up again, so just want to. Butters or the people accessing this area actually need that in the real time. But people are becoming, my daughter's asthmatic, we have lots of you know air quality issues in this area and it is vital to us. So um, if you can take that into consideration and um, as far as what those contaminants are, because like the ones that are available to us don't have break down the contaminants other than the PM25 and um, you know, some general averages and that's not really helpful to us in knowing what we're, we're getting into. Thank you, Mr. We'll, we'll certainly look into that. Um, we've, we've worked on that. Thank you. Anybody we want? Hi. Somebody answered. Um, I visited the site with my family over the weekend, and what happens? I don't know um, what the plan is for the already lost square footage of the park. 
there are certain areas where the pathway used to have like from here to the table, um, I mean, even like 2019. Um, and now, you know, there's a pathway and it's, it's like three feet maybe and then everything just drops off. I didn't know if there was a plan from the state for, or anything to kind of uh, refresh, uh, rebuild the loss of square footage since the compressor has come in. It's not its fault, but it's also, I don't know if this is part of the scope. Um, <clears throat> I know um, we've been burnt before <laughs> with air testing, which is why we're so focused on it. There are a lot of people that have a lot of issues already, <clears throat> excuse me, in the area. And uh, what I'm wondering about is water testing. Like, when you start digging that stuff up, um, first of all, what's going to be the protection for the workers doing this? Because previously with DEP, they let they let uh, Enbridge's workers who were doing excavation go in up over their head. I mean, there's a Boston Globe uh, photo. And you can see all the burner bricks and the clinkers and crap. Like, like, like it's an archaeological dig. They were over in the metering station. What's the PPE going to be for the people doing this work? As well as how do you keep, um, how are you going to keep that contained in the cove? I mean, it's already littered with stuff. If you've been down there during low tide, you've seen the bricks, you've seen the clinkers, some big as my head. Um, how, how is that gonna be contained? Also, um, something that actually Rob has brought up quite a bit. We need signs down there, big time. Lots of communication because a lot of people go down there and they have zero idea what they're getting into. Um, adults, little kids, animals, um, signage, signage while stuff is happening and just in general. Um, I did notice with, actually I didn't, somebody else is smarter than me, uh, that this permitting schedule, looking down at the permit approvals activity, your project has more reviews with the state that the compressor ever got. <laughs> and that's kind of just not your fault, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a gut punch. Um, and I did want to say, like, we don't know you. We're just meeting you, right? I'm not speaking for everybody, okay? I don't know you. I'm just hearing you guys for the first time. TRC wrote the garbage resource reports at the federal level for, for this compressor, and every single report that has come federal, state, everything has been built off of garbage upon garbage upon garbage, which is part of why, like, Margaret's like, does anybody go back and check anybody else's work? FERC doesn't check TRC's work. They call this rural. Like, this is so right. You have to understand the utter PTSD that we have that we have experienced since, what, 2015? Yeah. Um, and, you know, we're, we're hoping for the best here. These people have been on this for almost 10 years. They know a lot of stuff they didn't know when this first started. Um, and if you want to see, I don't know if you've read the uh, Boston Globe Spotlight from uh, December 2021, um, you can find out how, yeah, 2020, December 12, 2020. Spotlight investigation on how how this was shoved on us in the first place. Anyway, I really hope for the best with all of this. I hope you're on the up and up. Um, I want to have a good feeling about this because the square footage of that park and that whole like toxic waste dump that's topped over, it's eroding month after month, and it doesn't even need a store. Um, so thanks. Sorry, that, that may be a reminder of uh, a comment that I forgot um, that, that I want to put on the record for everybody here and for the record, I'll put it in writing too, but um, the town of Weymouth, I think Harbor Master's office did put up some signage about um, contaminated shellfish. And I know in this report, I believe it mentioned contaminated shellfish and um, that, you know, 
you don't want people eating it from the bacterial perspective, but also for the, you know, the, the uh, contaminants in the soil or sediment. Um, but uh, my request would be, and I've said this at previous meetings and in writing, is that the uh, applicant property owners um, post signage in multiple languages, you know, as an environmental justice community. Um, you know, you're gonna have to go through the environmental justice review, but have that signage in multiple languages. I know, I know the, the town mm -hmm. did, did what they could, but the, um, the Division of Marine Fisheries has a sign on their website. You could take the PDF of that and, and print up signs or whatever, but they have it in multiple languages, say this is contaminated, uh, shellfish, do not eat, do not harvest with the picture. So I think that's something that should be posted. You know, there's one currently at the entrance of the park, but it's only in English. There is a picture, but I think there should be one posted there and going towards the beach, um, just to let people know about that and on, you know, in the beach area. So I just wanted that for the record, thanks. Okay. And what are you going to do about the water? Could you answer that? So in terms of the, uh, the containment of that area, so there, there will be turbidity curtains which are placed around uh, the, the area of work. Um, so for those that, that aren't familiar, a turbidity curtain <coughs> is a bottom weighted uh, curtain with a floating boom. Um, and so that would prevent uh, any sediment from getting into uh, the uh, into Jake's Cove. Um, that will have to be monitored as part of the mitigation and, and the orders of, uh, of the perk approvals um, to ensure that that uh, turbidity curtain is maintained and that there is not a visible increase in turbidity around the, the work area. Um, we've also uh, we'll be asked the contractor to, to do as much of the work in the dry as possible uh, so that there is not active work within the water. And also making sure of the PPE for the people who are digging in the arsenic and, you know, asbestos laden. Soil. Yes. <laughs> I'm just going to repeat the question. Um, so you're asking about the PPE during the construction process. There is a health and safety plan included as an appendix to the phase four report. Um, I know folks are saying it's a long report, so I apologize, but it's it's in the appendices. So that is meant to protect the workers, um, and they would be briefed on that as well as you know going through all the required PPE, making sure folks have PPE. Um, so that is. other areas outside of the cove, in other beaches, um, and um, all the way down to Abigail Adams Park, which is the other river, North River, um, that river, and back to Fort Bryce, back river, back river, back river, so over by the back river, um, there's like that cove there, um, we okay. found material there that seems likely to have come. Um, Construction starting not very soon. What things are going to prevent more material? Because this is a rapid deterioration going on there. What, what, what's going to prevent more of this? And how can we make sure that somehow that is addressed? Mm -hmm. It's really showing up everywhere. Yeah, so um, this is a long schedule. Uh, I think that our team was brought on to try and get. <coughs> this permanent schedule as, as quickly as possible to get us to what we think is, is something that we all want to see here, uh, which is an improvement to conditions uh, to, to, to uh, prevent further exposure of uh, potential upland uh, contaminants. Um, the, the challenge is the permitting process does take a long time, and it, and it is complicated. Uh, it was noted that, that there are more permits here than with the Constitution itself. Um, you know, I, well. I think that that is reflective of doing any work with a coastal environment. Done what we can within the schedule to try and streamline that. Uh, but because these are resource areas, uh, mm -hmm. that it is a coastal bank, uh, there is a coastal beach here, uh, we do need to follow the, the applicable state regulations and obtain the correct permits. Sorry. Um, two things. What if you, you have 12 inches, right, that you're digging? What if realize ah, there's so much more under here that's still that same garbage like the toxic stuff do you just go oh well that's it because we only said 12 inches like what happens with that and 
also we were supposed to get a MEPA review, um, but Governor Baker didn't feel it was necessary for the compressor. <laughs> uh, so with regard to 12 inches, um, you know, I, I do want to just remind everybody that the uh, what's being excavated from that portion of the beach um, was determined to be of no uh, significant risk, uh, biological risk to invertebrates, um, but it does pose uh, you know, the potential uh, for a health risk or, uh, for those, those invertebrates. So what we're trying to do is balance what we think is uh, an effective solution to improve the conditions in that area with the impact of the actual construction, because that, that ultimately will have you know, a significant impact on those invertebrates as well. Um, and so it, it really is that, that push and pull of trying to improve a condition without um, having an adverse uh, yeah. impact beyond uh, you know, what we think is appropriate for the benefit here. Hi. Jody Purdy Quinlan, Four River Watershed Association. So a little history, um, 25 years ago, I was brought on as the executive director of the Four River Watershed Association for a seven month project. I was also newly pregnant, so the timing was perfect. And then I got to know the people who were the Four River Watershed Association and the projects that they were working on. And here I am, 25 years later, and um, we're still fighting battles. And um, I have cleaned that beach with people right up until my son, an environmental science major, and UMass Amherst now um, did it for part of his senior project. Um, the amount of clinkers on that beach I have been complaining about for 25 years. And this is an opportunity that really needs to be taken to clean that beach. I have a friend, a late friend, that um, lived on one of the houses on the beach and had a store across the street on Bridge Street. And um, she died a horrific death. Um, and totally and completely due to this environment. And she didn't know what she was getting into when she purchased that house. And she thought she was so lucky that she could go swimming at her beach every day. I grew up in North Weymouth, and um, I can tell you that those clinkers are all over. They're not just at the North Parcel surrounding King Cove area. Um, in fact, there's one in the West Augusta historic site, piece of property that I, per I got the town to preserve 25 years ago, and we were cleaning up, and I even found them in there. And I understand from some of the neighbors that they were actually used at one point in people's gardens oh. as decorations, I guess. Um, so I'd like to reiterate what Robert brought up earlier. He was showing a photo. Um, we were interveners in the um, Scythe Energy's permitting process with the Energy Facility Siting Board. And one of our requests was to extend the um, park, the, the walkway, to come around the MWRA property and extend along and basically just do the entire north parcel um, and then lead over to Levels Grove. And that has never been done. In addition, um, we requested the um, North Parcel be given to the town of Weymouth from Scythe Energies um, as um, part of our mitigation so that we could prevent something like this from happening in the future. And um, we were literally booed at town meeting for having such nerve 
to look into the future and understand that um, that we needed one corner of the Four River Basin to be green. And it was green at that point, other than the MWRA building and a couple of small things and the um, oil tank. Um, we requested that the oil tank be removed. Um, we, if, if we could have moved forward with this, um, the next step is we would have had this declared a super fun site and this compressor station would never be there. And it should not be there. This is a big mistake. And, um, but, you know, and I understand that the Atlantic Bridge project is coming down the line and that they plan on putting an even bigger pipeline um, that will then um, put an even bigger compressor station on the site. So there's a lot going on there. My father-in-law retired from the DPW and he told me many stories of how they would bring ash from the um, incinerator and um, other nefarious substances and dump them on the site. And um, so this is a very dangerous piece of property and it should not, I mean, it's nice that we were able to push and get beautiful park in there, but at that time you didn't risk being um, incinerated while you were walking along the waterway. Um, I'm very concerned about this whole project and um, how this is going to play out and I would ask that you please take into consideration um, everything that our neighbors are um, presenting to us tonight and um, on that note, um, hold on one second please bear with me, um, just look at my notes. Um, so, um, you know, I'd like to see an alternative plan that, um, that addresses the community's concerns and the challenges of the community. Um, I'm very concerned about erosion and removing contaminated sediment for the safety of the residents and the environment. Um, the beach should be a place where people can go and walk and enjoy and not worry about the risk of um, carcinogens and other such things. And um, there is no reason why, um, with all the money put into this and all the money that is being made in the gas and oil industry in this country and across the world, and the number of deaths that have taken place all over the world in the name of oil and gas, that we cannot have a clean beach in North Weymouth next to a environmental disaster. Um, I'd like to recommend extending the Cobble Berm um, near construction access to mitigate potential impacts. Um, the um, replanting of native species and in avoiding any invasive plants to promote ecological integrity. Um, and again, the um, what we call the West Waterfront Easement, the um, extending the walkway for those who would like to um, risk their lives. Um, and so, um, one more thing. Sorry. I don't know how I did anything without a phone. Okay. Um, I'd like to refer you to, and I will um, happily send this along. Um, but from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Energy Facility Site Board in the matter of the petition of Site Edgar Development LLC for approval to
construct a bulk generating facility in the town of Weymouth, Massachusetts. The final decision on February 11th, 2000. And you will see in there, in the 126 pages, um, the concerns of the Four River Watershed Association as interveners in the siting process and the permitting process. And I'd like to just make note, you know, to everybody, the public, um, my deepest regrets that I um, didn't win this one and that um, it would have been worth ending up in the Four River with cement shoes to prevent this from ever happening. And I'm not joking. I really felt that that's where I was heading in the future if I tried to stop this. And we were very, very much in the position to stop this. But anyway, the northern portion, the company indicated that it did not currently have any plans for the northern portion of the site, except potentially to refurbish and reuse the existing, existing 11 million gallon oil tank. The company noted that it has agreed to repaint the northern oil tank, provide public access along King's Cove, and achieve a mutually agreeable plan for the development or use of the land on the north portion of the site. Four River Watershed Association argued that the entire northern portion of the site, less the proposed MWRA IPS station, should be preserved as open space for public access. The Four River Watershed Association asserted that the northern portion is not needed for the operation of the proposed facility and contended that the facility is not water dependent and thus should be subject to higher public access standards than water dependent uses under CZM and WPA regulations. The Four River Watershed Association argued that protection of and public access to the northern portion which is 88% filled tide lands, would provide one, assurance that all feasible measures have been taken to avoid or minimize detriments to water-related interests, maritime recreation, and associated public access. Two, protection and enhancement of public views of the shoreline. Three, access to historic sites. Four, an increase in wildlife habitat. Five, an increase in groundwater recharge. Six, increased protection against non-point pollution to the river. And seven, increased public appreciation and protection of the river. In addition, the Four River Watershed Association asserted that opening the northern portion to public access would support many object objectives established by the CZM program in Chapter 91. So I won't go on, but um, I will refer this, and it's available, it's easy to find, and um, I think that you should look at it, and, um, and I could really use some help going after um, Scythe Energies or Calpine or whoever, and let's get some money out of them. <laughs>
that's selected yet. So that's what, at what point will the contract be selected? Uh, typically not until we have all permits in hand um, or, or close to having all permits in hand. So judging on the schedule, that would not be until sort of the fall 2025 period. Okay. Construction would have to be soon thereafter. Yes. So how would the public, you'll notify us who the contractor is? Or is there a process for that? Mm -hmm. It's certainly something that we can take in under advisement um, and work with the team to see if there's... Are they usually local to, people that have a familiarity with our shorelines? There, there's generally a preference for, uh, for local contractors. So if they do go out to bid, like how many? Yes, so we, we will solicit, uh, solicit bids from multiple uh, contractors to implement. So multiple, is that five or ten or more? Do you want to talk about your request a bit? Yeah. So we're going to have a limited work shown, and that was on some of the slides that you've seen. Um, and so the contractor will be required to stay within those limits of work, um, and that will be continued to be shown on our permitting documents, including the notice of intent of the Lincoln Conservation Commission. Okay. And what do you think the work zone will look like? Will there be multiple vehicles down there, two vehicles at a time? How many, how many people working? We don't know. I think I would expect multiple vehicles um, because we're uh, restricting the contractor to doing that dredge only during low tide. Restricting uh, what, I'm sorry. We're restricting the contractor to doing completing the dredge, which is the removal of the yeah. fill below mean high water. Um, and they're, they're, so they're going to have a time restriction with that uh, because it's being uh, done during low tide. I would expect that they probably want multiple um, trucks, multiple uh, excavators because they have such a time restriction there. So I would expect multiple vehicles and construction of a And when you talk, you talk about a different access to the beach area, so what will that be? So the access is gonna be on Bridge Street. Um, there's a small uh, access area uh, just to the east of Kings Cove Park. Um, and so that really, that access allows us not to drive through the park to get to the beach because we're really limited on how we can access the beach. Right. Um, and so that's a little bit tougher to access, but we thought that uh, it really provided a better project because you're not driving through uh, the park itself. Um, so that's what we're proposing to access. It's impossible not to have to do that to get, I don't know how much to get to the beach without driving. I think through one corner of the park. Yeah, no, so we're actually going to access off the first street. Thank you. 
kidding me. Really? typically is not something that the state regulatory agencies want to see in a coastal environment. They're really looking to preserve those dynamic uh, coastal environments. Um, so what we have here is our sort of best attempt to balance that, uh, to stabilize what's there, uh, to provide you know, a, a stability, to, to provide a robust shoreline in that area, uh, but we can't just place new fill because it, mm. is, it does change that resource area. Okay.
Seeing none, I, can, um, I just want to thank everybody for your attendance tonight and your participation. Uh, I know that this is a, a project that has a long history, um, not just this project, but the rest of the, the site, um, and that you've all been engaged in politics for a long time. So we, we appreciate your passion and appreciate all your uh, feedback today. Thank you. Thank you.